Hey everybody, welcome back to Living Room Lectures as we continue through the document De Verbum, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation in the church. And right now we're going to continue through chapter 5, the section on the New Testament. And we'll jump into that with number 17. So we're going to read this and uh, feel free to follow along with your own text. The word of God, which is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe is set forth and shows its power in a most excellent way in the writings of the New Testament. For when the fullness of time arrived, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us in his fullness of graces and truth. Christ established the kingdom of God on earth, manifested his Father and himself by deeds and words, and completed his work by his death, resurrection, and glorious ascension, and by the sending of the Holy Spirit. Having been lifted up from the earth, he draws all men to himself. He who alone has the words of eternal life. This mystery had not been manifested to other generations, as it was now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Holy Spirit, so that they might preach the gospel, stir up faith in Jesus Christ and Lord, and gather together the church. Now the writings of the New Testament stand as a perpetual and divine witness to these realities. So the first thing I'd like to point out from this is that the uh, second sentence begins, For when the fullness of time arrived, the word was made fl flesh and dwelt among us. The fullness of time. When you think about just that saying, it's like time has hit a limit with the entrance of God into time. Uh, in Jesus. It's as if when Jesus comes, time can get no fuller. It's like the existence of the universe has been filled up and completed with God becoming a part of his creation, which is kind of just a, a cool thing to think about. Uh, oftentimes we think of sort of this glorious future in the world in which everything is going to be made, made good and right. Um, but for Christians, I mean, honestly, it's like with Jesus, old, things can't really get any better. And really, like, all of what we're doing is trying to make Jesus more present in the world. Uh, but it's like, Jesus is the final word, and uh, there's nothing, like, more significant that's going to happen in human history in all of the time that uh, we could or might not have ahead of us. It tells us that Christ established the kingdom of God on earth. And this is worth reflecting on a little bit too. You know, uh, a kingdom is ruled over by a king. And if we're baptized, we become part of God's people, part of the kingdom of God. So let me throw this at you. Have you ever thought of yourself as ruled over by a king? Like, my loyalty is to my king in a total sense. You know, just like thinking back in, in the days and ages in history when the whole world was was ruled by kings and queens, and it's like everyone sort of, they identified themselves in a sense like primarily as a subject to their king and sort of like belonging to the king or the queen or whoever was ruling. And a lot of times we reject that in this day and age, especially as Americans, we're vehemently opposed to any sense of royalty or, you know, some authoritarian ruling over us. And yet, as followers of Jesus, like, even more than our, our government, even more than the nation we belong to, we are the followers of a king. Jesus established the kingdom of God, and we are part of that kingdom. It's worth reflecting on. It says he manifested his father in himself. One of Jesus' most important works is to reveal the father to us. We see this in a particularly special way in the Gospel of John. This really comes through that Jesus is like, if you've seen the father, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And uh, in a certain sense, like the only way we can truly know the father is through Jesus. It's through Jesus that we can come to know that there's a father in heaven who loves us. It tells us then that he completed his work by his death, resurrection, and glorious ascension, and by the sending of the Holy Spirit. This is interesting, too, in that uh, Jesus' work is done. He's finished. He's kind of, like, done everything needs to be done. And this goes back to that idea of, like, the fullness of time has hit. Uh, 
when Jesus lives his life, goes through his passion, death, resurrection, ascension, sends the Holy Spirit, it's like there's nothing more to be done except for all of that to take its course. It's like the catalyst has hit, the the change is happening, and there's really no way to reverse anything, and there's nothing new that's going to enter into history that's going to uh, t- be able to take that out of it. Like, history has been forever changed, um, and Christ has completed his work. There's certain people that advocate this idea that kind of like, um, God changes with us. Uh, particularly, there was a group of theologians, they were called process theologians, who, who basically said like, well, God kind of changes along with us. He enters into history and then um, um, sort of like as we progress and develop and, and learn as a human community, God kind of progresses and learns with us and he's all part of this. And this is kind of a rejection of that kind of thing in the fact that like, no, if Jesus has completed his work, then uh really our biggest job and responsibility is to like return to that, return to what Jesus has done, to recognize what's happened there, to recognize uh, what the fruits and graces of that were, um, and to like to fully enter into that. And that's ultimately what's going to be most important for the world. It's not uh, something new that's going to happen in the future. Uh, even though it's like, how Jesus's work affects the future is going to look different according to the time and the place and the people, uh, because God continues to work through us. But even in the work that we do as followers of Jesus, like we're really just sort of accessing the completed work that's already been done and sort of bringing that forward and making that present in our day and age where each of us live and in our families and our communities, et cetera. And we would actually say that the work of Jesus, the completed work of Jesus, like that's what we have access to through through the liturgy of the church, and that's what we have access to in the sacraments. In liturgia, uh, liturgy comes from this Greek word, which um, people say means work of the people. In a sense, it's like the work of the people, like, you know, bringing the work of Jesus into the world. You know, uh, when we do liturgy, we're, we're bringing Jesus' completed work. Then it says that having been lifted up from the earth, he draws all men to himself. He who alone has the words of eternal life. And uh, one of the things we can say about Jesus' ascension is that in a sense, it's Jesus' ascension that makes him sort of equally accessible to all people. You know, that it's uh, the the limit and the extent of his work and his action isn't... um, Uh, sort of tied into just a particular locale that he happens to physically be at at a time. But through his ascension, he's he's made sort of uh, available to all, and in particular, especially through the members of his church as they spread out and share the gospel with the world. Then this mystery of Jesus' life, his work, has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets and the Holy Spirit that they might preach the gospel, stir up faith in Jesus, Christ and Lord, and gather together to the church. I kind of like this turn of phrase that they use. They might preach the gospel, stir up faith, and gather together to the church. And I also like the fact like it brings all those things together. So we're not just called to preach the gospel, uh, but we're, all, we're called to also stir up faith in people. Uh, to bring people to faith in Jesus, and with that, to gather together the church. That's that's part of the job and the role of um, evangelization is to gather together the church, so that uh, Christians and those who believe, like we're not scattered, we're not sort of left alone as individuals, but. Uh, part of the the work that the church does is to bring us together into unity with, what, with one another, it brings us into communion, uh, which goes back to the sacraments and the liturgy and everything we do. Um, nobody can be a believer in Jesus on their own. Like there's, uh, if if we're isolated, we're not a fully a part of him and his life. And so um, it's important for us to remember that we are called not just to preach Jesus to the world, but also to stir up faith in Jesus, and through doing that, bringing people together. Bringing people together to worship him and continue that work in action. Okay, going on, number 18. 
It is common knowledge that among all the scriptures, even those of the New Testament, the Gospels have a special preeminence, and rightly so, for they are the principal witness for the life and teaching of the Incarnate Word, our Savior. The Church has always and everywhere held and continues to hold that the four Gospels are of apostolic origin. For what the Apostles preached in fulfillment of the commission of Christ, Afterwards they themselves, and apostolic men under the inspiration of the divine spirit, had and on to us in writing, the foundation of faith, namely the fourfold gospel, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think what we do at Mass really illustrates this. There's this uh, ancient term, lex orandi, lex credendi, the rule of prayers, the rule of belief. Basically, what we pray is what we believe. And uh, if you go to Mass, you can see that the Gospels hold a special preeminence because uh, we have a special Alleluia. We typically have a uh, some kind of Gospel procession. When we're using incense, we incense the Gospels because we recognize that these, in some way, they bring us to the life and the reality of Jesus in a way that uh, the other books of scripture sort of don't make as real. These are the the, the testimonies that uh, we carry in the church, and uh, they're near and dear to our hearts, and they s- reveal Jesus in the fullness of his life in, uh, in a particular way. Mass and our liturgy really illustrates that. Also just point out that there's not four gospels, there's one gospel, and there's four witnesses to that gospel. And that's why also at Mass we say, uh, you know, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, according to Mark, according to John. It's sort of four different witnesses to the one gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a short section, so we're going on 19. Holy Mother Church has firmly and with absolute constancy held and continues to hold that the four gospels just named whose historical character the church unhesitatingly asserts, faithfully hand on what Jesus Christ, while living among men, really did and taught for their eternal salvation until the day he was taken up into heaven. Indeed, after the ascension of the Lord, the apostles handed on to their hearers what he had said and done. This they did with that clearer understanding which they enjoyed after they had been instructed by the glorious events of Christ's life and taught by the light of the Spirit of Truth. The sacred authors wrote the four Gospels, selecting some things from the many which had been handed on by word or mouth or in writing, reducing some of them to a synthesis, explaining some things in view of the situation of their churches, and preserving the form of proclamations, but always in such a fashion that they told us the honest truth about Jesus. For their intention in writing was that either from their own memory and recollections or from the witnesses of those who themselves from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, we might know the truth concerning those matters about which we have been instructed. So I think I talked about before about how you have people throughout history, for instance, like Thomas Jefferson, who would uh, cut out parts of the Gospels that uh, they didn't really think happened. Um... I think Thomas Jefferson cut out all the miracles, for instance. Um, You got other people. There was a more modern movement that uh, tried to figure out, based on historical and textual criticism, like what Jesus actually said versus what was probably just added in by the disciples. And kind of the point of these things is like, well, we can't really trust all of the Gospels. Uh, We can't trust everything that's been written because maybe some of it was made up. Maybe some of it was kind of twisted by the apostles. And uh, uh, what you actually end up with in those situations is like a gospel that really just looks like the people who are doing the critique. You know, it's like they basically find the stuff that fits for them. And uh, uh, that's what Jesus ends up saying, more or less. It's kind of interesting how that seems to work. Uh, but, you know, here the church is saying like, no, we have, we take these things like full force. Um, These are accurate testimonies to what Jesus said and did. You know, it's possible that in certain places things are synthesized. You know, it maybe doesn't capture every single word that was spoken by everybody in a room in a situation or every movement or every specific action. You know, um, uh, it's not going to sort of, 
each book is going to take on a different emphasis according to like who it was being written for in some way. So for example, you know, like Matthew is written specifically uh, more for Jewish community. Uh, Luke is written more specifically for uh, Gentiles. And so they bring out and they have kind of different focuses, like keeping those things in mind. So they have different emphasis. They're explaining some things in view of the situation of their churches, uh, you know, depending on whether their church is, you know, that the writer was in, uh, in Jerusalem or Palestine. So like Luke would have been a Hellenist. And so he was writing things from a Greek perspective versus Matthew, who would have been more just a part of the, uh, the, the really the non-Greek, the, the very Palestinian Jewish community. So they're going to talk about things in different ways, trying to uh, help proclaim the gospel and stir up faith in Jesus and gather people into the church. You know, they wrote each of their gospels sort of with that aim to sort of different groups of people in mind. Just like you think today, you know, it's uh, we have to evangelize and reach out to people in a lot of different ways. If we were writing gospels today, you know, you, you wouldn't probably write the exact same gospel for somebody living in uh, South America as you would in uh, mainland Asia or, uh, you know, the same gospel that we'd have here in the United States, you probably wouldn't write all the same stuff as you would in uh, South America, you know. Um, you got to think like these authors are working from a very, their, their perspective in which they live and work and according to the people that they encounter. And so uh, those differences in flavor are going to come out in each of the Gospels, and they do. There's also another point in here that I think is kind of interesting to bring out, which is, uh, Indeed, after the ascension of the Lord, the apostles handed on to their hearers what he had said and done. This they did with a clear understanding, which they enjoyed after they had been instructed by the glorious events of Christ's life and taught by the light of the Spirit of truth. And this goes back to the fact that we can't understand Jesus and who he is until his work is complete. And his work is not complete until he ascends into heaven and sends the Holy Spirit. Like, everything before that has to be taken in continuity. And so, the apostles, as they live through those things, like, they couldn't understand them in their proper context. Everything had to be done before they could have the full understanding of who Jesus is. And, uh, and so it's, it's literally, it's not until they receive the Holy Spirit that they finally have come to like the full revelation of Jesus, which is something that's kind of interesting to think about. And it also kind of fits in with our understanding of confirmation, how uh, it's not until we've been confirmed and had uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us that we can be fully receptive and uh, fully enter into the life that uh, God wants to give us. That uh, that reception of the Holy Spirit and confirmation sort of opens us up to the fuller understanding of the mystery that uh, what 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 God has done. Um, so that's true for the apostles in some way we could say that that's, uh, true for us today as we continue to live in the church. Okie dokes. Last number for this chapter, number 20. Besides the four gospels, the canon of the New Testament also contains the epistles of St. Paul and other apostolic writings composed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by which according to the wise plan of God, those matters which concern Christ the Lord are confirmed. His true teaching is more and fully stated. The saving power of the divine work of Christ is preached. The story is told of the beginnings of the church and its marvelous growth, and its glorious fulfillment is foretold. For the Lord Jesus was with his apostles as he had promised, and sent them the Advocate Spirit who would lead them into the fullness of truth. And so this goes back to what I was just saying about the, the apostles not understand until they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, you could say uh, after the four Gospels, the, the canon of the New Testament, all the writings, all the letters, the Acts of the Apostles on um, up through Revelation, that's like all the, the church like processing this and like putting a more concrete form on it. 
the New Testament is is like, okay, now we've received the full revelation of Jesus. His work is complete. And we're going to put flesh on that. How does that actually affect us like at a day-to-day level? How do does that affect us in our community? You know, how are we supposed to know uh, how that affects uh, believers, um, you know, when there's infighting? What do we do when uh, somebody comes into the community and is lying and causing problems? How do we recognize who a true evangelist is versus somebody who's uh, distorting the gospel? You know, it's like the the letters in the New Testament, the writings of the New Testament outside of the gospels, like they really sort of, they put flesh on that because of things that were happening in the early church. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the writers filled with the Holy Spirit are responding to these problems and teaching us about like, you know, who Jesus is in a more deep way what the church is in a more deep way, how God lives and acts in our lives in a more deep way. And these writings are composed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit according to the wise plan of God. And so that's why they're part of the canon. That's why they are part of the, uh, the books of the Bible. That's why we still continue to hold them near and dear. That's it for this chapter, everybody. Thanks for joining. Hit the subscribe link if you haven't done that yet. And we'll see you again in the next chapter, chapter six, Sacred Scripture and Life of the Church.